Uh, so yeah, I would, um, for people online, I just gave a very, I just gave my presentation title. So I'll be talking about um, building adaptable code for bespoke web, uh, web applications for conducting structured expert elicitation. Uh, and this was built as part of a bigger project between the University of York, including Laura Boyke and Marta Swaj, and our colleagues at Lumanity, including Dawn Lee here and uh, James Holtzcroft. So just a very brief overview in case you're wondering what level of our knowledge you need to have to follow the presentation. Um, the, first, uh, the, the first 10 minutes of the presentation are going to be not very technical at all. So I'll go over the project background and a brief introduction to what structured expert elucidation is. And then I will give a, a general overview of the shiny code and the, the user defined elements of it. So what you need to understand about the code in order to create your own app. And that doesn't require very specific, well, it doesn't, it requires basic knowledge of R, but no specific shiny knowledge. And then the last five minutes, I'm going to indulge and talk about more technical detail of how the app was built. Uh, and that does assumes that you have some shiny experience um, and actually talks about lots of problems that Joe talked about in the last presentation, but a slightly different solution to them. So the background about the project, um, these are quite strong statements and I won't go into great detail in order to focus on the, on the uh, code but expert judgments are regularly used in healthcare decision-making, whether it's to inform model structures or to, to um, place weights or uh, define parameters in a model. Um, and there is sort of a general move to try and make these processes for eliciting uh, experts beliefs more structured. Uh, so for example, we, we believe that experts have some experience and knowledge that gives them the ability to either estimate a parameter or to extrapolate knowledge from a similar setting. Uh, and we use these structured processes to help them encode these beliefs in, in a quantitative form so we can use it in the model. Uh, so this structured process looks something like this. Um, so it has various um, stages in the process, including a systematic process for identifying variables, identifying relevant experts uh, that doesn't just involve sort of calling the colleagues that you're aware of that work in the field. Um, it's about uh, giving experts the tools, so preparation uh, and training for experts to make sure that they can use the relevant format uh, and then conducting the exercise, deciding on how to do it, whether to do it in person, whether to do it one on one with individual experts and then aggregate their beliefs separately, or whether to um, call for a focus group and get experts to, to come to a consensus on the particular value of a parameter. Uh, and, and various steps after that. And the idea is to manage biases and sort of validate the process and results throughout this process as you go along. So the, the sort of the, the juicy bit that we're getting at with, this, is, with elicitation is, and particularly for the methods that I'll be talking about today, is trying to elicit their uncertainty about the value of a parameter. So this is a completely hypothetical example where, for example, we want to know what proportion of patients will respond to drug X after three months of treatment. Uh, and this is just one possible way of eliciting that uncertainty is to give them this grid uh, where on the x-axis they have a plausible range of parameter values um, and i'll talk about what that means a bit later on um, and this this range is split into intervals or bins and then they can place chips to effectively uh, to express their uncertainty effectively drawing a histogram that expresses their uncertainty in the beliefs there are other methods to carry out elicitation but this is the most the trickiest code which is why i've focused on it so far but other methods exist such as asking experts for specific uh, quantiles of, of a parameter so for example the median and interquartile range and then uh, fitting a distribution to that uh, so so there is an interest in sort of using these structured processes uh, last year there was a reference protocol published for methods for structured expert elicitation um, but there is a, a lack of resources to actually implement it, so it takes quite a long time to first of all decide on how to conduct it, and also it takes a long time to, to create ways of collecting that information in a way that's comprehensive to experts who, are not, who don't normally think like this and don't normally express their beliefs in this way. So the aim of our project was to develop a website with open access resources for conducting structured expert elicitation in order to trans uh, streamline the process while maintaining robustness in the methods. So the open, uh, open source resources include a step-by-step -step guide, uh, a database of existing exercises so people can find um, previous examples where similar methods were used, uh, and open source templates for developing new exercises. So this includes anything from consent forms and protocol templates to what I'll be focusing on here, which is the actual tools for collecting information from experts. And we're going to um, publish different formats, but today I'm going to talk about the R code. 
Um, and the idea is to create to create bespoke uh, shiny applications that experts can just complete via our website. Uh, so it's easy for them to complete and they're very flexible. So, so there are lots of um, ways where you can, the content of the app is dependent on the previous inputs, which isn't necessarily as easy. So it's not possible in Word and it's not as easy in Excel. So a little bit about the Shine tool. Um, this, um, it, it's basically a set of, it's a Shiny app uh, and it set, has a set of files that's downloaded in a folder. And there are three different um, scripts and, and folders here that need to be updated in order to make the app work and to make it bespoke to your example. So the first one, in fact, it might be easier if I show you an example of the actual created app. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. I won't make it full screen for the sake of people in a room and the ribbon at the top. Um, but here we have a, a home page that can also collect information about experts' characteristics. It can inc inc include a consent form as well. We have instructions that incorporate um, information on how, what types of parameters you want to ask for, uh, what do we mean by uncertainty, um, and how it differs from variability, um, and how they can express their uncertainty, including some examples of, of distributions and of histograms and what they say about experts' beliefs. And then we include background information, which is currently blank, but this can be edited uh, by the user very easily, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then the final tab is questions, and this particular app has four questions, but it can have any number at all. So first question is, for example, what proportion of patients will respond to drug A after three months of treatment? And they can input, let's say, 10 to 15%. Click on continue. And that then creates a grid, and the, the plausible range of the grid is defined by experts' input. It's always slightly wider, as recommended in the elicitation literature. And they can just click on cells to then complete them to draw their histogram. There are various troubleshooting options included as well. So for example, if they don't use up all their chips and they try to move on, they get a little pop-up message that tells them they need to go back. And eventually when the histogram is drawn, it provides automated uh, verbal feedback on what their distribution means. So this is usually in reference to the most uh, likely interval. So it tells them the probability of, of the parameter having a value less than that interval with an interval or, or higher. And then they just save with just one click of a button. So going back to the structure of the app. So we have the three, three parts of the app um, that can be edited and they need to be edited in order to make the app work. So there's this www folder that contains uh, HTML files. And this is information for your home page. Uh, this is any consent form you want to include, questions about, um, uh, sorry, background information about your project um, and uh, instructions. So again, um, the, the HTML files can be opened in Word and really easily edited. So for the example we've given here includes uh, to, to teach experts how to use this tool. It has a run an example about how long it takes, uh, the average length of stay of patients with myocardial infarction, um, uh, yeah, hospital stay, but this can be then edited easily in Word and, and included in the app uh, without any technical skills. Uh, so the second adaptable part includes manual inputs, and this is a fairly short script that just tells you what's included in the app and a, a little bit about the parameters being elicited. So whether to include a consent form, that's yes or no. Whether to include questions about experts and their experience, that's a yes or no. Which elicitation method to use. So it's currently set to chips and bins, but we're in the process of building in other methods like quartiles and tertiles. And then questions about the parameters, including the number of parameters being elicited, what they actually are, so the name of them. And this is just the vector uh, with names of, of the actual parameters, similar for their units, and then upper and lower limit. Um, so for example here, the first quantity is a proportion, the unit is percentage, and then the upper and lower minute, uh, limits are zero to 100%. And then it also includes the actual elicitation questions, which are just written as characters in a vector. Uh, and it gives a choice of whether you want to save uh, experts' answers locally, where they click on a button and it downloads the file, the except, uh, CSV file with their answers that then they have to email back to the investigator, 
or whether to save it on Dropbox, noting that uh, in order to save it on Dropbox, uh, it can't contain any um, sensitive information. And then the final part of the, uh, the final modifiable part of the app is the About You script. Um, and this is an optional extra if you want to ask about experts' experience within the app. And this is, this is separate from the rest of the app purely for ease of use. So if you don't want to ask anything about experts' experience, then uh, you can ignore this script. But otherwise, this is just standard. It's just a, a single object. Oh, excuse me. Uh, a single object with um, standard uh, R shiny widgets used to collect information about experts. And yet you can switch this off by, by uh, in that manual inputs file. So this is the sort of bare minimum that you need to use in order to create an app uh, and make it run. And then I'll go into a little bit about how it actually functions in the background and uh, some of the solutions I managed to find to, to the challenges that Joe was talking about before me. Um, so first I'll go into the user interface. It's very, very brief uh, because most of the user interface is uh, defined in the server. Uh, so the user interface itself uh, only contains the, the layout of the tabs and um, the, the actual content of the tabs is actually created in user UI outputs within the server. Um, so why did we do that? This is just an example I found online of a standard. Um, so this is primarily to make it easier uh, to create conditional content. So for, for text or what experts see to be dependent on the previous inputs. So if you're creating code in your um, user interface, you'll be using conditional panels. Uh, with, so th this chunk of code here, uh, which essentially reads a condition. Um, but as, as you probably know, uh, the user interface code can only read uh, um, reactive uh, values in terms of output objects. So it would be very difficult to, uh, it's tricky to make this. So for example, this hist here is just a string of characters, but if you wanted it to be something that an expert has previously entered, then it becomes a lot trickier. Um, so whereas if you're creating a user interface in your server code, um, you would write the code as you normally would, so it reads all the user interface code as, as a user interface would, but you can also add any other R syntax. So for example, instead of using a conditional panel, you can just use an if function and, and then continue as, usual, um, as normal. And it also has the benefit of just being a little less clunky because you can use a, a range of formats. You can just read in a HTML file or a picture without creating a, a HTML output object and then read it in, into the user interface and so on. So just a bit easier. Uh, in order to implement this, there is just, um, I'm going to move on for the sake of timekeeping, I'll be a bit quicker, but basically um, uh, one thing you need to just bear in mind is that inputs uh, may need to be saved as reactive values rather and then you, if they're used in, um, in equations later on or, or conditions later on in the app. Um, and this is, for example, so in this um, app that I showed earlier, the home page has an introduction section. And then when you click on next, um, that tells the app to, to change the screen to a different, to the consent form. However, when you go to the consent form, this next button disappears because it's no longer there. Um, and then the, the app crashes. So the idea is to, instead of using the input value and the conditions, you, you're saving it uh, as a reactive value. And then you're using that in following um, conditions. Um, and then I think I have time to just go into a little bit more detail. I can do another live demo of just what the, how the code is laid out. Um, solicitation. The solicitation parameters uh, file contains most of the functions. Um, so, for example, the chips and bins plot parameters. For example, there is a possible bin width, so to make sure that the, the, there aren't any sort of decimal points between in the intervals. Uh, there's the actual chips and bins plots, uh, the functions to provide that feedback on experts priors, and then any conditions that lead to error messages and the saving functions. Um, 
And then there, I created a separate file uh, just again for, for tidiness, uh, a chips and bin script, which essentially contains all the user interface that you need for the questions. Um, so, and, and this is just a function. Um, so it, 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 it's a, a function uh, that uses user interface code. And then it just depends on all the plot inputs, for example, the minimum and maximum values that experts enter and so on. So that when you're creating your code for each individual question, you don't have to create a new user interface every time you just run this function uh, and a, a apply function in which you wrap the, the output. Um, and then yeah, it's essentially about 15 lines of code to repeat it every time. And it gets repeated as many times as, as the questions you've specified. So that, that's sort of uh, the overview of, of the code. Um, it's still work in progress, so it's not the prettiest app in the world, and there are still more options that we're going to build in. But uh, I welcome any questions and also any suggestions for how to improve it. Um, in particular, how to whether it's possible to save an input history in our so that if experts log out, they can come back into the app and not start again from the beginning. Thank you. We have eight minutes for seven minutes for questions. So let's start in the room. Anyone got questions in the room? Yeah, I'd be interested to hear. Um, an example of where you've used it or where you're planning on. Yeah. Uh, so I I won't dare run a live one that I haven't tested on this computer, <laughs> but uh, we've used that. This is sort of a product of years of various solicitation ex um, exercises being used. So I think that the most recent one was actually used in the recent nice appraisal of antimicrobials when they were testing the new model for uh, funding uh, antimicrobials to reduce resistance. Uh, so, so we used it there to, uh, we elicited the length of stay and 30 day mortality in various scenarios. Um, and that was used in a, eventually used in a base case. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. I, um, I'm interested in that setup in your project. You just copy across all your files. Because I, I, first of all, I thought you could write a shiny app for setting up the shiny app. <laughs> and then I thought you could have it in a package and you just run some functions in a package like so we are thinking about doing a package. Um I think uh, it's all down to what's the most user friendly and yeah. this started I think a few steps ago this seemed really simple and I, I like this idea of having the HTML files yeah but there is a lot sort of there is definitely a, a trade-off between flexibility of the app and making it user friendly yeah, and I think yeah but the text for example the background about the project is very project specific and that is something that I think will always have to be a HTML file um but uh but the function yeah. generate text about your background. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you can you know, do all sorts of things. But like I said, it, I just see it as an interesting and why not actually. <laughs> I, think, I think I'm slightly scared to, to try and create a package, right. but no, definitely okay. agree that it might be there. Uh, and we're definitely thinking about that. Thank you. Very well. How are that? I'm sure. Um, just in terms of functionality, what does your package, what is your that doesn't that isn't important in the shelf. Um, so, so we created this, not this necessarily, but sort of the previous app that we created was because we found that when working with clinicians, we really struggled to get them in the same room. Um, and we just had to do it individually and to kind of make it as easy possible, as easy for them as apps possible. And we found that these were just more bespoke um, and they don't require the investigator to be there to help them through it. Uh, which which shelf still does and match which also Vulcan shelf also it, it does require input from from the investigator actively whilst the expert is completing it. And got on the back. Uh, question on so what what is output in terms of the data to you as the the list? Um, so there it's a series of um, CSV files. Uh, and the idea is also to create code that can read those in. So at the moment it creates, for example, for, um, for this histogram, it would create the values on the x-axis and then how many chips they put into each one. 
uh, and when you have different scales from different experts um, it can be well it just takes a bit of coding to a bit of um, creative algorithm creation to 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 make it to streamline it but we're going to provide that as well that's fun so that's the question on the saving scenarios the way that we'll get around that is to uh, have a database somewhere so on a remote server mm. and then have the shiny app call that database and save scenarios to that or um, or graph scenarios from that and save it separately from the database. So, uh, yeah. And you can save your you can save your values on there too. So yeah. 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 yeah, that's good. Thanks. So got uh, one question in about the plan methods. Yeah, so um I'm just I was just thinking about the conditional panels that you talked about. Uh, uh, yeah. you're having trouble making them dynamic uh, uh, with the user input. So I'm wondering whether the inputs you're using for the view, where you're telling to use for the conditional panel comes from the data itself or from the user interacting with the, with the app? Because if it's, come, if it's come from the data, you, you, you keep thinking of incorporating the, the global app. So, yeah, so, so it comes from experts' inputs. Um, what they type in, for example, a quantity or something, and then it, that affects what they see afterwards. Um, and I just found that this was the easiest way to identify just by transferring all the user interface into the server. It just makes it a lot easier because you can just use conditions as you please and any variables that you created in there. You can't in the user one device. question. Um, yeah. um, but how do you get to conditions? How do you share the apps with clinicians when eliciting feedback? Um, so the step that I haven't introduced here, which is about four lines of code, is just that the, the app itself can be uh, deployed onto a website, and this can be free of charge with um, Shiny IO. Um, so the experts just get a web page that they can visit from any tablet, computer, or so it, it, it's easy to complete. Got another one minute, and we've got one question. How do you know it's the clinicians who provide the responses? That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in, in the last exercise that we did, we provided them like a unique code because uh, we didn't want to have any identifiable information. Um, so I guess they could share that code. I guess there's an element of trust. We emphasize the, the importance of the project and these values are really being used and you trust that clinicians wouldn't sacrifice their reputation <laughs> for a, for avoiding the exercise. <laughs>